Every second of every day, thousands of objects pass overhead, and yet we almost never notice them. At least, not directly. Since the dawn of the space age, we've been hurling machines in orbit on a very regular basis, and at any one moment there could be dozens of them above you. Now, before you bust out the tinfoil hats, know that these machines aren't usually tools for watching you eat a sandwich in the garden. From TV and telecommunications, to weather, imaging, and more, satellites play an extremely vital role in our society. Of all their uses, TV is probably the one we're most familiar with, so you already know that it's possible to pull information from satellites. But for most people, that's sort of where it ends. Recently, I got a chance to work with Artem Litvinovich. With a degree in cybernetics and computer science, his work never ceases to amaze me. From cameras that can see sound, to robots, plasma speakers, computer vision, and more, he's done a little bit of everything. I've put links to his stuff in the description, I'd highly recommend checking them out. When we met up, we were talking about the various bits of hardware we had each had, and started thinking of uses for each. Eventually he mentioned that he brought a Hack RF, which is a software-defined radio. I was already excited, because since my experiments with VLF radio, I wanted to play around with one. But then he mentioned that we could use it to pull information off of weather satellites as they passed overhead. To say I love the idea is an understatement, so we started digging into what it actually would take to do that. Turns out, it's actually really easy. There are four satellites that we'll be looking at in this video. First, the older NOAA 15, 18, and 19 satellites, and then the much newer Meteor M2 satellite. The NOAA satellites, or NOAA for short, broadcast an analog signal where every beep encodes a single line of an image, whereas Meteor broadcasts a digital signal that has a lot more data in it. As such, images from NOAA satellites come in as black and white, whereas Meteor images come in as false color. The first thing you'll need is a software-defined radio. We're using the Hack RF, but there are lots of other models that'll work just as well. I ordered some of them to try out, which you'll see in a future video. The next thing you'll need is an antenna. This is the point where you have lots of options. The simplest kind of antenna is called a dipole. To build one, you need two pieces of wire that can support their own weight, here we're using galvanized gardening wire, and a stick to secure it. A pencil will do it a pinch. Then you'll need some 50 ohm coax cable and the appropriate connector to, to attach it to your SDR and some alligator clips. Here we're using a small SMA coax connector. Radio is part of the electromagnetic spectrum and as such is made of electromagnetic waves. As these waves pass over the dipole, they induce a slight oscillating charge in the wires and our signal is encoded in these oscillations. But for this to happen efficiently, the length of the wires must be cut to very specific lengths, so they're in tune with the incoming waves. This is sort of analogous to how a guitar needs to be tuned to make the right sound. Generally, you want each of the two wires to be one quarter of the length of the wave, and the two together to be one half the length of the wave. Or, one half of the wavelength. For this experiment, we need an antenna tuned to about 137 megahertz, since that's the frequency that the satellites broadcast at. Luckily, most antennas work well within 50% of their center frequency, so if we build an antenna for 137, it'll still work well for several dozen megahertz in either direction. Since frequency and wavelength are related, we can figure out how long the wires should be using some simple math or an online calculator. So for 137 megahertz, one quarter of a wavelength is 52 centimeters. So we cut two pieces of wire to that length. Since this was our first test, we taped ours together using some electrical tape, quickly wired things up, and then looked up when the next satellite pass was. We used a site, which I've linked in the description, but there's also lots of other tools that let you do this, like Orbitron. Luckily, the pass was in the next 20 minutes, so we headed outside to try and catch it. Since this was our first experiment, we had nothing to mount the antenna on, so I just held it in the air, careful not to touch either of the wires. We opened up the SDR program, in this case SD Sharp, and started watching. Sure enough, right as the satellite was supposed to be over the horizon, a signal showed up. The lower part of the screen is called the waterfall, and you can see the distinct sawtooth looking signal of the analog satellite. When we were done recording, we tried to decode the image with some software we found online, but the signal quality was far too low. But that's okay, because we had successfully detected the satellite and knew we were on the right track. We spent the next two days looking into other antenna designs. First, we tried to use an umbrella, because the shape of the umbrella is actually perfect for doing stuff like this, but unfortunately the coating on the umbrella prevented it from working. 
We'll try that again in a future video, once we can find a better umbrella. Next we tried to build a helical quadrifiller antenna. The plans for it can be found online, and I've put a link in the description. Unfortunately, this antenna didn't work so well, so I won't go into too much detail about how we built it. It's not to say that these antennas can't work, we just didn't have the parts to build a nice one. We may try again in a future video. For this antenna, we found a wooden pole lying on the side of the road to act as our main support. We cut more wire, this time far longer, then bent and twisted the wire into a helix. Turns out, the angles of everything are really important, and this was one of the reasons why the antenna didn't work so well. At first, we had lots of sharp corners in the wire, and the helix wasn't quite the right shape, so our reception was about as good as the pencil. Also, these antennas are supposed to be omnidirectional, but because ours wasn't built quite right, we found we had to be pointing directly at the satellite as it moved. While this looked really cool because we were tracking a thing moving many kilometers per second through space, it made for a really inconsistent signal. We tweaked and improved, and after several attempts we got our first piece of an image. It was only a sliver, but this was definite detail. Shortly after this, we decided it was time to upgrade the antenna again. This time, we decided to go with something that should be both simpler to build and properly omnidirectional, so we don't need to point directly at the satellite. For this, we decided to build a double cross antenna. It's basically four dipoles mounted in pairs across from each other and tilted to 30 degrees. They're tilted because the radio signal coming from the satellites is polarized, in this case, right hand circularly polarized. If you tip the dipoles the wrong direction, the signal won't be able to properly interact with the antenna. To build it, we first disassembled our last antenna so that we could salvage the pole. Then we got some of our students to help us first straighten and then cut the wire we needed to length. We need eight pieces, each 52 centimeters long and as straight as possible. We added a little bend to the end of each wire so that we could more easily attach the wiring to them later. Instead of pencils, we used small wooden dowels, each cut about a foot long. The length isn't critical, it just needs to be enough to support the wires and be thick enough to allow us to drill a screw through it later. Then we assembled our four dipoles using a little bit of clear packing tape. I'm sure there are better ways to do it, but we used what we had on hand. Then we cut the cross supports for the top. These are just two pieces of wood cut to 20 centimeters in length. We drilled a hole through the center of each piece, put a screw through the middle, and mounted it to the top of the pole in a cross pattern. We marked the center of each of our dipoles, then attached them to each side of the cross using a single screw. I later added a second screw next to each so that the dipoles can only tilt to 30 degrees and no further. That way, if they get bumped, it's easy to reset them. With everything mounted, we moved on to the wiring. When we first did this, we realized we didn't have enough coax, and rather than wait a day and go get more, we used some random coax we found lying around that was meant for satellite TV. This ended up being a big problem and we had to fix later, so if you try and build this, don't do that. Use proper 50 ohm coax for everything. The wiring had a bunch of really specific requirements, like the lengths of each piece of coax and how to connect everything. In short, you need two pieces of coax cut to one quarter the length of the wave, and two pieces cut to one half the length of the wave. This is because we need to delay the signals coming from one pair of dipoles so that everything lines up properly on the output. I won't go into more detail here, but I've linked to a great document on everything you need to know in the description, including the lengths of the wires and how to connect everything. We first soldered all the coax onto the dipoles, and then to each other, and tried to make sure that nothing was at sharp angles. Then we checked everything to make sure that nothing was touching that wasn't supposed to be and that all of our connections were good. Finally, we added a male SMA connector at the bottom and were ready to try it out. Since 137 MHz is close to the radio broadcast range, we set the receiver up to pick up normal radio broadcasts. Sure enough, the signal was coming in strong and clear, far better than any of our previous tests. We checked the next set of satellite passes and headed out to try again. It's really important to find a place that has very little radio noise. We're kind of on the edge of town, so we were lucky enough to find a big open field with very little noise. In our previous tests, we were mostly looking at the NOAA satellites, because even if the signal quality is low, we can still get part of an image. Meteor is a digital signal, and since the signal quality needed to be far higher, we had never attempted it until now. It happened to be the next satellite to pass overhead, so since we had our new antenna, we figured we might as well try it. 
Right as the pass was supposed to happen, it started to rain really hard, so Artem huddled under an umbrella to keep the electronics dry, while I stood out in the rain with the antenna. As the satellite moves towards and away from us, the signal undergoes Doppler shift. Doppler shift is the same thing that makes the pitch of an ambulance change as it drives by. When it's moving towards you, the pitch increases, and when it moves away, it decreases. The same thing happens with our signal. Since we were trying for a digital signal, we needed some tracking software to calculate this, and stay on top of the signal as it moves. It also gives us some information about the current elevation and direction of the satellite. As the satellite rose in the sky, high enough to get above an apartment building in the distance, the signal started to appear. We had to play with the gain a bit to boost the signal enough to pick it up properly, but when everything was set right, the program locked onto the signal and started downloading data. We held as still as possible for fear of disturbing the download, and by the time the satellite set, we downloaded 65 megabytes of data. Of course, this was about the time that it stopped raining. I didn't want to get my camera wet, so I don't actually have footage of that first pass, but we tried it again the next morning when it was sunny, and this is what you've been watching. Next comes the job of decoding the signal. Unfortunately, the published data sheet by the Russian government was totally inaccurate of how to do this, so we had to hunt around a little bit online. Eventually, we found some software that could do it. The first pass was at night, so even though we got three channels of data, two of them were completely black. But in the thermal infrared channel, we could clearly see clouds. It had worked, we'd pulled an image directly off of the satellite. When we tried again the next morning, when it was sunny, we managed to get our first clear image with all three channels. When we combined them, we were left with a colorful image of us as seen from space. We've since pulled images both from Meteor and NOAA satellites. We made a few more refinements, like wrapping the HackRF in tinfoil and grounding it to act as a Faraday cage. This reduced the noise even further. We've gotten so good at it we can casually do it from our front yard now, and each image is more spectacular than the last. In one of our Meteor images, we can clearly see Buenos Aires, Sao Paulo, and Rio as dark grey blobs, as well as the coast of Brazil and Florianopolis. We can get the thermal images from Meteor using one of our decoding programs, and they look pretty amazing as well. The NOAA images, while less colorful, are just as spectacular. I've put a link to a gallery of all of our photos in the description down below. When it comes to decoding these images, that'll have to be a whole separate video, as there's lots of details to go over. I'll go through how the decoding software works and what it's doing, as well as the ins and outs of the various pieces of software. This whole experiment has really been eye-opening, and I've loved every second of it. And now we're already working on some of our next radio experiments. The satellites we've already pulled from also broadcast telemetry data, which includes not only information about the spacecraft, but also a ton of science data. Everything from the locations of anything tagged with a GPS collar or weather balloons, to radiation data and more. So we're already working on decoding all of that. We're also looking at other satellites that broadcast at other frequencies and collect different kinds of data. One of these, GOES-16, I saw get launched into space a few months ago while I was in Florida. If we can pull from it, we'll receive images of the entire planet, and since it's in geosynchronous orbit, we can pull data from it all day long. Finally, we've also built our first radio telescope, which can take images of the sky in radio frequencies. We've already taken our first images, and now that we know what we're doing, we'll be building more in the future to look at other frequencies. So keep an eye out for all of that in the near future. Okay guys, that's all I've got for this video. I hope you've enjoyed. If you liked this video, please be sure to leave a rating, and if there's any other cool radio projects you think we should look into, let us know in the comment section down below. If you want to follow our progress on all of our projects, Instagram and Facebook are the best places to do that. I'm constantly posting both pictures and videos of our experiments and work, so be sure to check those out. Also, I've recently set up a Patreon page, so if you like what I do and feel like helping to support the continued production of videos like this, feel free to check that out, but by no means should you feel obligated to do so. As always, the videos will remain free. I've also done a bit of writing and wrote a few articles, which I've linked in the description below. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.